Hello, everyone. I am excited, to say the least, to be here today. I have been waiting and waiting for this event. And I have to say, I have a lot of things that I'm doing all the time, but I was telling my dad, who's 95 years old, he said, what are you doing today? I said, I am going to one of the most awesome graduations. He said, where? I said, he said, Columbia Point. I think that's where you are, Columbia Point. I said, absolutely, yes, Columbia Point. So what I want to do today is I want to, first of all, introduce our dean and um, Dean David Cash. He is a warm and a generous dean. Yeah, David, I decided, you know what, I'm going to wait and I'm going to introduce him after I do my welcome. See, trying to get it together here. So first of all, good evening. Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to the graduation exercises for the Gender Leadership and Public Policy Program. We will be honoring our graduates tonight that we are very proud of. And for me, that is an absolute, unadulterated understatement. I am so excited to be here tonight to celebrate this important event with you. I would like to welcome and kindly acknowledge District Attorney Rachel Rollins. We were really, really, really blessed to have Rachel come tonight. I've been telling everyone that Rachel is going to be with us. I would also like to welcome Dean David Cash of the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies. Dr. Michael Johnson, the Chair of the Public Policy and Public Affairs Department. And his faculty, I think um, Arun, if Arun is here. And I'm not sure if Michael Ahn is here as well. And we'd also like to acknowledge our CWPP, Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy board members, Lori Tamor Berry. I don't know if Karen is here. I don't, I don't see her. And also, um, Tess. Tess. And I will have to tell you, one thing that's really, really wonderful about Tess is that I was getting dressed a few minutes ago. You don't have to do things at the last minute. And she was so gracious. Anything I can do to help you? And when I first came to UMass, I will have to say that she was like the kindest person and the warmest person. And when I saw her and talked to her, I wanted to come to UMass. So thank you so much. And I also want to acknowledge our faculty. Can you raise your hands, faculty? We will, we, will hear from, we will hear from them later. Our alumna, do we have alumni here? And I think we actually have a few prospective students in the room. If we have them, we're going to make sure that you don't get out of here before we talk to you. And of course, family and friends of our graduates. You all are very, very instrumental in providing the support to the students. Everything that you do to make it easier for them is extraordinarily important. And we don't want to make, we want to make sure that we acknowledge you for the support of our students. It's been a tough year. There's a lot of work involved. And you have been there with them. So again, thank you very, very much. And I also want to acknowledge the contributions of Dr. Ann Bookman, who was not here this evening, as she led the program, the GLPP program, for the last five years until December 2018. So let's just give a round of applause for Ann, even though she's not here, because she will see the video, I'm sure. And with much gratitude, I want to thank Muna Killenbach, Assistant Program Director for planning and coordinating this graduation event. Every year, Muna makes sure that every detail 
of the event is attended to and does it with calm and patience. Without her, this event would not take place. And I really, really mean that. That is no exaggeration. <laughs> Muna, <laughs> Muna, stand up, Muna. Go, Muna, go, Muna. Go, Muna. Go, Muna. <laughs> Finally, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge our internship coordinator and doctoral candidate. She's on the way, Denise Morrow. She's, she's keeping the program running. She's sort of like the person who's going to, Lori, do this, do that, do that. And our student workers, Tamara Lee Rock, Fatima Akar, for assisting with this event. So normally, as I alluded to you before, preparing remarks for events can seem like a chore. I'm sure for none of you it's a chore to, to put together remarks, right? But not so much for this graduation event. I actually, despite other responsibilities, couldn't wait to begin. Now I will have to say, even though I couldn't wait to begin, I still procrastinated a little bit. <laughs> preparing my remarks, I tried to not just use the left side of my brain but recognize that to teach and to lead is also spiritual in nature. It takes more than knowing facts and figures and theories. It takes heart, common sense, discernment, and the ability to connect. So how do I begin? I first want to say, and I'm looking at all of you, it has been an extreme honor and a privilege to lead the GLP program and to teach such an incredible, an incredible, and I'm gonna say it again, cohort of women. You are committed beyond measure to learning and growing regardless of your work, your family, community, personal obligations, or even health challenges. You have been dogged about your studies and are more than serious about the paths and the reasons for the paths that you want to take to enhance the lives of others and their communities. In my over 15 years of teaching, I have never seen such an animated group of students <laughs> debating, processing, pausing, listening, and also, what the best of it was, you all supported each other. You took care of each other. I saw it in the classroom. I saw it when we had our internship nights. And that's really nice. So this cohort has come together as a team. I am in awe of you, and I mean that. Nothing will stop you. You are clearly driven utilizing your gifts, your talents, and your insights gained through study, hard work, and of course, what my father used to say, hard knocks. You have and will continue to change the lives of women, people of color, and others in need in Boston, Massachusetts, and throughout the world. Because we do have individuals here and graduates here who have traveled long distances to come. Your tenacity, your force, and your perseverance is indomitable. You will, will, will make a difference. You enter the class of 2018, auspicious timing. Some say it was the year of the woman. For most of recorded American history, political power has looked a certain way. Portraits of power, can we say it? Call those older white men dressed in suits and depicted in formal settings. The midterm elections in the United States Congress made headlines for the Democratic blue wave, but it also delivered a record of women leaders. Women now make up nearly a quarter of the new Congress. And I'm not gonna say everything I was gonna say, I'm gonna make it a little bit brief, but of the 120, 112 women elected, there are some first, two are Native American, two are Muslim, and two will be the youngest to serve as lawmakers. And we have Rachel Rollins as well, as a pathfinder. So again, there's a lot of core issues. We know that women earn 80 cents for every dollar a man earns. Wages are barely budging in this country, but the cost of childcare has gone up. We have reproductive rights that are on attack right now. We, we know that there's legislation going on in a number of states. And we also know that more young women go to college than men, but un unequal pay makes it harder for them 
to pay back their student loans. We also have maternal mortality, and we have a difference in maternal mortality for African American women in this country. So I could go on and on about the problems, but I'm gonna move forward. One of the things that's really, really interesting is in, in the moment I sat and thought very carefully as I knew my time was limited to speak. On the eve of what is my mother's 95th birthday, I thought it would only be right to honor her by honoring you. My mother, Lily Bell, was 95 when she passed. She was slight in stature, but strong in temperament, skills, and brilliance, and service. She was feisty. She viewed the world with a critical lens and was unapologetic about who she was. As she aged, she, considered a, she was considered a wise, sensitive community advocate, administrator and elder in our community, respected for her work in the school system, the church, the community-based organizations, and the African-American community and beyond. She was a womanist. A, world, a word coined by Alice Walker, an American novelist, short storyteller, poet, and activist. Alice Walker's collection of essays, In Search of Our Mothers, Gardens, represented her personal recollections and sharing of wisdom developed through her activism in anti-racist and radical social justice movements in the United States, as well as her work as a writer. The definition of womanist is from womanist, a black feminist or feminist of color. So, if womanist is opposite from girlish. Girlish is frivolous, irresponsible, and not serious. When I first read Alice Walker's definition of womanist, I connected with it immediately for the term on which the definition is based. It refers to a girl who acts grown, in reality forward thinking and mature, who acts quick, in other words, self-motivated, and usually is someone who is perhaps even intrusively inquisitive asked a lot of questions. This young girl insists on speaking up and asking questions rather than being content with the knowledge gained from a position of the passive listener. In the expression womanist, there was the echoing of the admonition, admonitions that I and other girls had received, yet yeah, too grown, womanish, keep out of the affairs of adults. All the phrases were tantamount to mind your own business, nobody was talking to you. Yes, even with this admiration, as women as girls, we still, we still minded our own and other people's business. We didn't care. We were determined, and we were developing our consciousness about care and concern and willingness to step aside of, of our established boundaries and norms of strategies of communication and inquiry. Stepping out of the expected gender normative behavior. Have you ever heard the phrase, boys are raised, girls are trained? Translated this concept, a womanist refers to a woman of African descent who is, um, is audacious, outrageous, in charge, and responsible. Regardless of your race and age, our graduates are all womanists. In hope and transformation, a womanist in, engenders mutuality and community and responsibility and stewardship of freedom and honors the image of God or alternatively, the es essential goodness of all of us. Being a womanist is a way of thinking and living that takes seriously the exposure, analysis, and transformation of societal and personal injustices and oppressions that affect those who usually matter least in society. A womanist utilizes a interdisciplinary and intellect -se sexual, intersexual, sectional, can't say it, values and knowledge of everyday people who create the narrative for their needs that may represent through her policy making, policy analysis, a nonprofit worker, even her home. So again, you're going to represent the people. So again, I'm skipping through some of this for the interest of time, but one of the things that I want to say if a womanist is audacious and courageous, then to be a womanist is to not only engage in the easy dialogues, but also most especially to engage in the difficult ones. It means raising issues that maybe our mamas would not dare to raise or even know how to raise. 
We are obligated to move beyond the places of our displacement to the places of our discomfort and thus enlist the difficult dialogues. To reiterate, we are the name, we are to name the unjust privileges and even we are unwittedly, that we are even unwittedly complicit with. So what I'm saying is we can name these injustices, but at the same time, sometimes we're complicit in it. And we have to sort of look at ourselves and determine are we implicit in this, complicit in this. So again, I'm going to close in a minute so I can have time for this long, um, we're going to have a long meeting today. I call it a meeting, but it's a fun meeting. So one of the things I want to say is when we think about our work, does it contribute to survival and wholeness of the entire peoples, particularly people of color? Um, do we have authentic knowledge in that we are using our knowledge to foster good and not oppressive power? Are we also challenging and dominating power, including the complex discourses that help individuals maintain their power? One thing Foucault said, he reminds us that power, especially in equitable power, projects the will of knowledge. In other words, power enlists the intellectual community to provide the unnecessary knowledge base to legitimate and sustain that. So what I'm saying here is that if there is a story, and there's a story about people that we care about, there's a story about our communities that does not sit well with you, it is our obligation to make sure that we dismantle that story, that we provide a counter story to that. So again, one of the things I also want you to think about is that we should also pay attention to what we call mothers, who have what we call taken for granted wisdom. I remember this one day, when I was a little kid, I was watching, you know, cowboys and Indians on TV, and I'm rooting for the cowboys. I'm like, yeah, yeah, the cowboys, you know, let's, 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 let's beat up the others. And my mother, who has what we call take it for granted wisdom, she said to me, she said to me, okay, but do you know that they might not be rooting for you, those cowboys? And I said, what do you mean, mama? She said, I'll explain it to you some, some other day. So at the end of the day, it is important that you know, we as women and we as people of color, that we make sure that we continue to dispel those myths. One other thing that she said one day, she asked me, what did you learn in school today? And you know what I told her? I said, I learned that Thomas Jefferson, it was probably my great, great grandfather that I don't know about, was a great man and the father of democracy. My mother implied, yeah, did they also tell you that he owns slaves? So again, we have to tell the whole story, not just part of it. So what I'm just going to, to close with is that I'm going, to, I'm going to close with that we must remember that each of us is a leader, a divine original. We are created to make unique contributions in life, one that only we and that means all of you, only you individually can make. This is true for you, this is true for me. That said, turn any obstacles that you have that are in your path and dust them away. Focus on what you believe are your own true, strong, incredible assets. And I can tell you, you all are some bad, bad, and I won't say the word here, sisters, all of you. I am incredibly, incredibly, and I'm gonna say it again, proud of you. You have the power to succeed. You have already demonstrated that to me and everyone else around you. Even if people tell you that you need a little bit more time and you don't have what it tells, don't believe the lie. Release the known and embrace the new and encompass your life. Go out and make a difference. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to introduce Dean David Cash. One thing about David, it, you know, it, he's actually, he's my boss, okay? And I can say I would not have wished for a better boss than he is. 
And I don't even let, you know, I don't even, I'm the type of person, I don't like bosses. I don't, you know, it doesn't work for me very well. I can't tell any places I left because I don't like bosses. But he is absolutely warm and generous. And one thing he's always done is that he has supported the center in so many ways. He's always highlighted our accomplishments at the State House, in the university, and beyond. And what he has also done is a couple of times I said, David, you know, we need a little bit more. And David has normally been very, very generous. So he's been generous with his time. He's been generous with his mentorship. And again, I just want to thank him for that. But I want to say a little bit more about him. He is a, he is a great gentleman, but he's also very, very accomplished, to say the least. David has spent his career trying to understand and better harness knowledge to solve pressing policy challenges. He earned a PhD in public policy from Harvard, and he concentrated in environment and natural resources. And he's got a lot more education other than that, but what I think I want to focus on is that he worked for the Deval Patrick administration, and while in state government, he worked on a number of catalytic roles. He helped to transform the Commonwealth's energy and environmental policy and regulatory landscape. His job history includes senior positions at the Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Public Utilities, and the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. In these roles, he helped to develop and implement nation-leading science-based environmental, climate, clean, energy, water, and waste management regulatory programs. He's innovative, and he is someone that, again, has been a leader in this field. And I also want to say, while working in state government positions, he also extended his efforts internationally, participating in the U.S. State Department's mission to India on clean energy and climate and and also via USAID collaborations with regulations and policymakers in Tanzania and Ghana. So again, we have this illustrious, kind, nice, and accomplished. So David, come on up. And David's going to introduce District Attorney. Oh, I am. I am. Good evening, everybody. What a wonderful, wonderful event tonight. After a year of such hard working and accomplishments and challenges and, uh, and uh, uh, taking on those challenges with gusto, it's just fantastic to, to see you all here on, uh, on this evening. Um, I also uh, wanna thank, that was a great list of thank yous. It should be clear that to put something like this together and the program together takes a huge community, a community of faculty and staff and students, et cetera, and outside um, advisors. So uh, your thank yous were great. I also want to just thank the folks who also make this work, Harry taking photos, Mike and Zach on the video, Ernest, who's been in and out with the food. Thank you to all of you to make this, make this work. And I really want to thank Lori. So uh, Lori came in, as you know, in the middle of the year, never easy to do. Uh, trying to fill the shoes of someone who had been here for five years, never easy to do. In the midst of a financial crisis, never easy to do. Don't even have to go into the details how difficult it was to kind of get the contract done, make sure she was here on time, had the right support, all of these kinds of things, not to mention that she added her commute, which is like 17 hours or something like that. Um, and she has done an incredible job, so thank you so much, Lori, for all that you've done. I will say that in addition to her focus on this program, she has reached out to the College of Nursing and Health Sciences, to our gerontology department, to many uh, places on campus realizing the importance of interdisciplinarity and intersectionality, and that has been huge for the entire campus, so thank you for that as well. So um, this is the third time in about eight months that I've had the pleasure and the honor to introduce District Attorney Rachel Rollins. I am so lucky, um, although what I'm unlucky is about, it's always in passing. You know, she comes in, we say hi, I come up here, I introduce her, I sit down, she comes up here. So I, th I don't think I'm gonna do that. I think I'm just gonna spend 15 minutes talking with you right now. Can I I wish I could, because you know, the whole Deval Patrick, we're both alums of working in state government. 
tackling the kind of problems that you're all learning about, and you're figuring out the solutions and the pathways to do that. And I could go through her long, illustrious history and what she's been the first at and all those kind of things, but I'm not going to, because although that gives you the measure of a person, that doesn't really capture an essence of the kind of leader that District Attorney Rollins is. And I just, the, the thing that has struck me about watching, uh, watching her in the news and watching her at speeches she's given here is her courage. If I were to capture in one word about her, it would be courage. And that's because if I take something simple, we invited her, uh, she was the speaker at our annual, very important speech that happens um, in this college in the Conflict Resolution Department, the Slomoff Lecture, and it was about violence in communities. So we had a law enforcement person come here to talk about violence in the community and how to, how to stop it and how to deal with it when it happens. And she didn't get up there and, and do that script. She got up there and started to talk about what breeds violence, what's missing in the community, how has our state, our society, our economy failed the people who are doing violence and failed the victims of that violence. It was about education and healthcare and community and housing, realizing that all of these things, if not done well by our society, if not done well by governance, leads to the kind of violence. And taking that on, kind of turning things on its head, that's not easy. That's not easy at all, particularly for a law enforcement leader. And if you, again, if you watch her in the news recently, uh, it's just incredible. Taking on the governor, taking on a, a federal administrator, I, I know, I know, and I, you know, here I'm saying that too, but, you know, I, and, I, and I'll say the governor and the administration are folks we work with all the time and folks she works with all the time. But there's a time where as a leader, you stand up and you say what's important to say and you put your integrity on the line and you put your integrity and your values on the line. And time and time again, we are seeing you do that as a district attorney. And that's a rare thing to see. And you as students of policy, students of how to get things done, keep your eye on her. Emulate her. Figure out in your own way how to have that courage. And it won't be for everybody. God knows I would not have. I could not do what she has done. I have my courage in my own way. I think it's smaller than her courage. But I have it in my own way. And each of you, part of your job as leaders is to figure out where that courage is, where it is where you step up to the line and over the line of what's comfortable for you to get things done. So with that, again, not going through the list of all your amazing accomplishments, because that's it in my mind. So please. Join me in welcoming Rachel. This awesome. um, congratulations. I'm really proud of you guys. I've been reading about you in the book or the little uh, note, uh, whatever the hell this is called. But um, I want to I wanna give you, I'm not going to take a lot of time, I promise, but I want to um, give you six tips uh, that I've thought long and hard about since um, recently going through, I'd say the last three years of my life, I'm 48, were the most sort of action-packed with changes and scares and, um, you know, moments that I was really proud of myself and other moments where I doubted myself uh, and what was possible. Um, so there are just six things that I reflecting back on um, that time that I would love to sort of give to you and I hope you take away from them. So they're just sort of mandates, right? And the first one of all, and I know there are other people in the room, so I'm speaking to you too, but mostly these, is it 11 of you? Yeah, 11. Um, the first thing I wanna tell you and, and request of you is to please be grateful. So I am your district attorney or the district attorney for Boston, Chelsea, Winthrop, Revere. I was sworn in on January 2nd. Um, since January 1st of this year, there have been 14 homicides. Uh, there have been any number of non-fatal shootings, um, sexual assaults, rapes, horrible things happening to children. Um, as I, uh, the new district attorney, my rule is that I get notified anytime there's a homicide. I don't care what time it is. If there's a body at the scene, I wake up and I go. The police do a great job in investigating, but the community, um, the police 
they are not speaking to the community usually because they're working on the investigation, and that is a gap. There's a hole there that I think um, needs to be filled. And so my first assistant and I show up, and I can assure you that every single person of those 14 that I have seen um, woke up that morning and thought they had more time. So any morning, no matter what is happening in your life, no matter how horrible you think it is, how you cannot think of moving on to another day. If you wake up and you take a breath, you are better than um, many of the people that I am dealing with. And I promise the other five are a lot more upbeat. But like the first one is, I want you to be grateful every single day that you have a day. Um, the second thing is be deliberate. One of the things I learned is if you wander through life and have no plan, you can not be surprised when you blink your eyes and one year, three years, 10 years, 15 years have gone by. Um, now, whether it's as small as making a list before you go to bed or when you wake up of what you'd like to accomplish that day, I do that often. If there's 15 things on the list, I usually get through two or three, but that's an accomplishment. Um, when I decided to run for office, I didn't just wake up one day and say like, you know what, I'm gonna be the district attorney of Suffolk County. It, you know, it sort of started that way, but then I had to have a lot more internal conversations of what does this look like? I've never run for office before. Um, I'm, you know, so I'm a first time candidate, I am a woman, and I am a visible person of color, which is the trifecta of you're gonna lose, right? So um, I was incredibly deliberate. And when I, I like to tease people and say, I'm good at everything I do because I only do three things at a time, right? Like, so the best word you can all learn in your lives, no matter how old or young you are, is no. Um, now, as women, I wanna make sure that if you are given an opportunity that you can't take, when I'm called and asked to be on the board of directors of somebody's like cousin's group that he started in his garage, okay. I wish your cousin the best of luck. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to do it, but here are two people that I think would be great to be on that weird board of directors that I don't want anything to do with, right? Or whatever the answer is for you, right? So, but I will tell you, I get a lot of requests to um, be involved in things and I have to be really protective of my time, right? Not just my time as the district attorney, but we can't lose sight of the fact that I'm still a person, right? I have children that I'm responsible for. I have myself that I'm responsible for. And if, I like to remind people, if you've flown before, they say you put the mask on yourself first and then on the child. Because if we aren't alive, we can't take care of all the other people we do. So I want you to be deliberate and think long and hard about what your plan is, but also be deliberate about making sure you're taking care of yourself. The third thing is for women, and we are terrible at this, and I'm gonna keep repeating it, is know your worth. And the best gift I got was about three years ago, um, I learned my worth. And I, it's not just about money, um, but it is about money. Don't get me wrong, right? Money's important. But I will tell you, um, you have to be, you have to know in your heart what you are capable of. And, and when you get there, nothing anyone else says to you uh, matters. And what I will share with you that I actually have not shared before um, is an email that happened between uh, my father and I right when I decided that I was gonna run. But I want you to hear me say that strangers will tell you you can't do things, um, and that's, it's hurtful if you're in a school and you know somebody here in this program says we don't think you can X, Y, or Z. But oftentimes people you love, love a lot, and truly love you are gonna be maybe saying things to you that you don't feel like are supportive, they're saying it because they love you, number one. And number two, they don't wanna see you fail. It's not that they believe you are gonna fail, it's that they, don't, they want to spare you the hurt and the anguish and the sorrow and the sadness of that failure potentially. And like as a mom, I have a 15 year old daughter, if I could homeschool her till she gets to 30, you know, I would probably go insane myself, but I would spare her all the hurt, but to sort of quote Finding Nemo, like she would never get to learn on her own, right? And so we have to do that. So this is a real email um, that my father sent me after I um, decided I was gonna announce that I was running. So it's February 28th of last year. 
Rachel, I've given your idea a lot of thought and I can't recommend it for the following reasons. One, the residency issue could be a career ending embarrassment. Two, Bostonians, especially the ones that vote, are very uh, parochial. Um, three, politics, politics in Boston is a blood sport, nothing is sacred. Four, four if it's your goal to get involved with, local, with the local political party, if, if this is your goal, get involved with the local political party and try to work with the Middlesex DA's office with the goal of possibly succeeding her. So I took three minutes and wrote this. And my, my, I'm in love with my father. Like we are, I'm gonna probably go out and have two drinks with him right when I leave here tonight. So like we're fine. But I wrote, thanks for your honesty, dad. I plan on printing and framing this email. It will be the first thing I hang up in my office as the Suffolk County DA. I love you, Rachel. And so two days later, he wrote back, okay, then it's on. FY, Rollins was the name of a great political family in Roxbury. They were, all, they were like rolling for Rollins, which ended up being what my statement was. Um, I want the job of high sheriff of Suffolk County. Let's get this started, right? So the point is, is that that could have crippled me, right? That's my father. Um, who I adore and who I will tell you adores me more than anything. It's not that he does not think that I'm capable. He just didn't want to see me hurt, right? And so remember that, is that it is very hard when, you know, and I need to learn this too, when people are saying things about you, you feel like it's about you, and oftentimes it's not. Um, but you need to know your worth. Uh, number four, ignore the noise and do the work. So. Never been a woman DA in Suffolk County elected. Uh, never been a woman of color in the history of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which dates back, what, five trillion years, you know, that has ever been the, the DA elected. Um, you know, you've never run for office before. Um, I'm a single parent. I'm divorced. Uh, I have a beautiful 15-year-old daughter. My ex-husband is a great dad, but many of you who have heard me speak before, I'm the guardian of two of my nieces. Um, because in addition to you know, being a former prosecutor and having all these degrees, um, the reason why I believe I'm the DA and was elected is I have siblings that are currently incarcerated. We have the same two parents. We were raised in the exact same household. Um, I have a younger sibling who's struggling with opioid addiction right now. And as a result of those life situations or choices, whatever they are, whatever word you choose to use, I'm the guardian of two of my nieces. And so basically, I am a single mom of three children, two of whom are not mine, and they are 15, 10, and 6. And I'm going to have like a Rashid Wallace patch of gray hair right here and like Nobody watches the Celtics, but anyways. Um, the point is, he had a big patch of gray hair, and I love Rashid, but the point is, is that if I listened to all of the noise, I would not be standing here as your DA. And don't worry about whether you have blood family, who's around you supporting you. We can't choose our family, who we are born into. As you get older, you choose who you surround yourself with, and get yourself a squad. Right? So ignore the noise, do the work. And then I love to say number five, always do what's right, not what's easy. And this is what the dean talked about. It's very easy for me to talk about women's issues. It's very easy for me to talk about you know, disparities when it comes to black and brown people. Um, as of today, I am not an LGBTQ person. But if I'm silent on issues that impact my brothers and sisters in that community, or, or my Jewish brothers and sisters, or Muslim, or re any other group of people that's being tormented, what, who am I to demand good treatment for me and mine, but then sit silently while other things are happening? Now, maybe you don't have to be as loud as I am all the time, and I am working on that too, but I will tell you, it is imperative that you use your voice when you have it, and you use your power when you have it. And I, tr I choose to do that as often as I can. And so when, you know, I like to remind people um, with respect to anything that happened with the governor, my point is just if you come for me, come for me, right? And you know, my attitude is I don't approach people with things until I know what it is I want to say and I know what the facts are. And so what happened um, was, I think, a situation where I felt very confident 
about what it is I had proposed because I'm deliberate with what I do. When I put out a memo, it wasn't just me throwing darts against the wall about some things that I thought might be good. I had spent almost a year speaking with police officers, prosecutors, judges, criminal defense attorneys, people returning from jail and prison, um, individuals that have touched the system in every single way about what I was proposing and got all of that information and synthesized it. And then we had data and evidence to support it. So for me, when I come back at people, it's always based on what I know is right and true. And hypocrisy is something that, you know, I feel like I'm 48 years old, back to being grateful you don't know how much time you have. When people are talking to me about things and they are being incredibly hypocritical and not understanding their privilege, I have no problem reminding them of that as quickly as possible. And so the last thing I will say is I'm really proud of the fact that we are utilizing the legal system to challenge ICE, which whether we win or lose, I am an athlete as a, as a person. And, and no matter whether, and, and I, I want you to hear me say this, as a former federal prosecutor, I defended ICE, right? That's what we do. And when I have a job, I do my job. But what I will tell you is the lawsuit that we filed is about ICE coming into public places and courthouses and removing people from those public places and courthouses. I have never challenged that ICE has the authority to remove people that are not here lawfully. That's a different issue. What I believe personally is, is, is irrelevant when it comes to being your DA, but where I do my business and work is in courthouses. And when people are terrified of coming forward to either be a witness or they are a victim of a crime and don't want to come in and report it, um, when we have people that want to use our courthouses for non-criminal things like restraining orders or you have a loved one who's addicted to drugs or has mental health issues and you want to section them, those aren't criminal matters. But there are individuals that are afraid to come forward and use our courts for fear of deportation. I'm proud that we're using the the legal system to have this fight, right? That's the proper channel to have the fight. And as I said, you know, I'm a former athlete. Um, I am teach my kids this all the time. Whatever the judge says, if we appeal, we listen to the rules. The you know, part of what I I love to talk about. Um, do what's right, not easy. I love speaking to, and it's not easy, but I do it. When I won my primary, the first show I went on was Tucker Carlson on Fox News. And the reason why I did is I firmly believe that I don't need to be speaking to people that already believe that I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. I love hearing that. If you want to write me letters or say it as I'm walking out, I will take it. But we're already on the same side of a lot of things. And even though we disagree in smaller degrees, we can't look over and say those people, whoever those people are, are crazy and we're right and wrong. That's why we're dealing with what we're dealing with in this country right now. So for me, it's not easy to tell my team that, no, 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 I don't want to go on some, you know, soft, underhanded show about how great I am, I want to go on Tucker Carlson. That's why I call into Howie Carr often, right? And I do, I know, but I really like Howie Carr. Stop it, I like him. <laughs> but I will tell you, because, you know what? But I, it's like, no, Howie, you, you can disagree with me, but you're not going to misquote me. I'm going to tell you what it is that I believe, and then we can have a conversation. But if we can't even, with sort of hushed tones or not screaming, have a conversation, then we've already lost. So for me, it is, it is right for me to reach my hand across to people that might not agree with what I'm proposing and say, let me tell you why I'm doing this. Tell me why I'm wrong so we can start a conversation. So always do what, what's right and not easy. And then I will end with this. Um, you know, a lot of people when I'm introduced, you know, I, I love hearing courage and that's something I, humbly accept, um, but I will say often it's, you know, she was this and the first of that and has degrees from here and won these awards and whatever, and no one ever talks about failure. And what I will tell you is that there have been so many times that I have failed in my life. Um, personally, <laughs> like, you know, I've been divorced and whether people consider that a failure or not, anyone who's gone through that process, it's never a happy thing. I have 
you know, had other situations with my health, which is not a failure per se, but you feel very much so like, am I gonna live through this procedure or process? I've had jobs that I, was, I, I applied for that I was sure I was going to get and never did. Um, and there are times, even in decisions as the district attorney, that I've made choices that I would, looking back now, say, huh, maybe I should have done that a little bit differently. But what I can tell you about failure, and this is the point you need to take away, everyone fails. What distinguishes exceptional people from others is how quickly do you learn and stand up and start walking forward again. Right? And, and how are you honest with yourself? If you are, have a failure where you are potentially sinking into a depression, which could happen as well, are you getting the help that you need? Right? Are you making sure you're taking care of your mental health? If there's not a mental health issue, how quickly do you learn, stand up, and start walking? That distinguishes exceptional people from the rest. Um, so be grateful, be deliberate, Know your worth, ignore the noise, always do what's right, and failure happens. And I'm very, very proud of all of you. Best of luck. Okay. Hi, everyone. At this point, at this point in the program, we'd like to um, recognize and introduce our wonderful faculty: Emily Hart, Elena Stone, Tracy Wallach, and Jin Zhao, who could not be here tonight, unfortunately. They have advised and worked closely with all our students to help them succeed, and I'd like to invite each of them one at a time actually, to come to the stage to share some of their reflections from this year. So I'd like to invite Emily Hart to come up right now. Hello graduates, it's so great to see you all tonight. I was really excited to come and get to catch up with you all and see you again. Um, for those of you who don't know me, as Muna said, my name is Emily Hart, and I taught the Women in U.S. Politics and Public Policy course last fall. Um, there are many things about you all as a group that made it a really fun and interesting semester, and I learned so much from you. But I'm, tonight, I'm just going to share briefly a few that stand out to me. So first is your wholehearted engagement. You brought your full selves to the course. I was, I was repeatedly impressed by your passion and openness in grappling with the various topics that we covered. You shared your own ideas and experiences, often very personally and candidly. You opened yourself up to new information and new views. Second, your respect for difference. You listened to each other and expressed a willingness to learn from each other. When people had divergent views, you navigated tensions while remaining a group, a cohesive group. You were generous and kind with one another, even as you disagreed. And third, one of the most striking things to me about this cohort, and Lori mentioned this as well in her welcome, was that how well you thought about one another. There was a real sense that you were in it together and you helped each other. You were thinking about the whole group and how to move everyone forward, not just how to get ahead individually, um, which is really remarkable. Each in your own way, you are also confident leaders. And thank you for all that you are already doing to make a difference in so many ways. 
I am inspired by your connectedness and determination, and I'm excited about how you will continue to develop your leadership in the world. So thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. And now we'd like to invite um, Elena Stone up to speak. So hi, everybody. Um, I have, for the past um, several years, have had the great privilege of being the internship faculty for um, the GLPP program. And uh, that has been a great joy for me. Um, I have to say that one of the things I love about it is that I have always um, believed very deeply in experiential education. And this has given me a chance to work with people who are really bringing their academic work and their experience together into a whole. And that's something that I, um, I find really exhilarating and exciting. And I love seeing people blossom in that way. Um, and for uh, this particular cohort, for all of you, I think it's, it has been particularly special. Um, as a couple other people have said, this, there have been some really special things about this group. Um, the way it's been clear that you've been on a path together and that there's been a sense of community and connection and caring that's been really palpable. Um, and when I thought about what I wanted to say to you today, um, I thought about three different things, three different words that sort of jumped out at me um, as um, just kind of as themes or frameworks or ways of, of thinking about how I've seen people grow and, and the ways that I've just kind of experienced who you are. So, so the first word is voice. Um, that it's been so wonderful to see all of you find your voices in different ways through the course of pursuing and, um, and experiencing your internships. And there are so many different kinds of voices in this class. Some are quieter and more thoughtful. Some are big and assertive. Some are more analytical and intellectual. Um, but no matter what, um, I can always hear the excitement of what you're learning and um, the, everything that is, all the growing that you're doing. And the way that those voices connect to not just where you are now, but the places that you come from, the, the cultures that you come from, all the experiences that you've had in your life, and all the ways that, that you have grown and are continuing to grow. Um, so the second word is values. Um, and I've loved just learning what you care about deeply, um, what grounds you, um, what's your north star, what is it that, that keeps you going, that motivates you, um, and seeing just the, the solid, solid places that you come from and the ways that you are determined to bring those values into the world. Um, we gain a lot of knowledge and skills in this program, but if we don't have those values that infuse the, the knowledge and the skills, then, um, then it's not gonna get us to the place we wanna go in terms of changing the world. And so to think about the values that you all have brought with you to the program and the way that those values have grown and the way that they've kept you going through the challenges that many of you have faced has been really important and wonderful to see. And the last word is vision. Um, and so vision, vision is really the big picture of what you're here for, what you want for yourself and what you want for the world. And that has been so apparent um, in the, the work that you have done in your internships, whether your internship is about, you know, some of you have very clearly articulated a very, very big values, like a 
wanting to do work for world peace, or wanting to make your communities more equitable, or wanting to prevent sexual assault and domestic violence, um, or wanting to make government work better, um, wanting every child to have the benefits of early childhood education, and so much more. Um, and to see the way that your visions have grown in this program and the way that, that those visions have inspired you has been a really wonderful and really beautiful thing and has inspired me very much. Um, so these are the three pieces that I've been thinking of and the way that they've been sort of braided together and the way they've infused everything that you are, um, all your intersectional identities and experiences, all your joys and your suffering, your ideas and your feelings, your intellect and your spirit, and the courage and the tenacity and the resilience that you've all brought to this program. So as I stand here and I look into your faces, I feel so grateful for your presence in my life over the past academic year and the connections I've been able to make in one way or another with each and every one of you, and I want you to know how important that's been to me. Um, I've learned so much from you, and you're each kind of like a strong and vibrant flower in a, a beautiful garden that's really blossoming right now in this time in history with women's power. So I thank you all, and I send you off with love and the knowledge that we are all connected and will remain so, and that your voices and your values and your vision will prevail, and that together we will all change the world. And now I'd like to invite up Tracy Wallach. everyone. So we have a new student here, class of 2030-something. Uh, OK, so congratulations. You made it. <laughs> um, the GLPP program is special in that it brings together a group of women who might otherwise never have met or perhaps even never have wanted to meet. You shared an interest in creating social and political change, but that was really all you had in common coming in. You come from different racial, ethnic, educational, political, and class backgrounds. You represent different generations, have different work, life, and political experiences and goals. So many differences can stir up anxiety and conflict. And after five con f working with five different cohorts, I'm telling you, it has happened. Um, they're also a great source of knowledge. Um, your cohort really stands out in your ability to create a community amidst all these differences. It's been really special for me to be a part of it and to watch and to be with you along the way. It's particularly significant given the larger environment of divisiveness and conflict in which we are now all embedded. It's been a difficult year on many levels. You were dropping like flies this semester. Um, each Thursday evening, I was nearly dropping like a fly this semester. Every Thursday evening, I would drive onto campus, usually completely exhausted and wondering why I was doing this in addition to my full-time job. But I never left feeling exhausted. Rather, I felt energized working with all of you. It was exciting and fun. Um, the ways that you supported each other and communicated with each other and learned from each other was really impressive. 
no matter how tired I was when I came in the classroom, I always left energized and grateful to have the experience of working with all of you. You've worked hard this year. Uh, between full-time course loads and internships, many of you also worked full-time or part-time jobs um, while also taking care of your families. You faced illness, often severe, and you did this at a time of greatly increased stress in our larger environment, when basic civil and human rights are once again being challenged and attacked. The change work you're engaged in or will engage in will challenge you physically, mentally, and emotionally. Remember, you can't do it alone. And you don't have to. You have each other still. You know, the, cor the courses are over, but you don't have to be over with each other. And you're now also part of a broader network of women who have graduated from the program. And I hope that you take advantage of that and call upon each other and those in the larger network for advice, consultation, mentorship, and support. Excuse me. As you move forward to take on new professional leadership and professional roles, I hope you'll also stay in touch with us, with me, um, on the faculty, and let us know what you're doing and how you're doing. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much, faculty. I will have to say that the faculty in this program are really very special. They work extraordinarily hard, and they're dedicated to each and every one of you. And I know that because sometimes they call and they just want to do the best for you. So again, I want to thank the faculty for all that they do, um, their intellect, their caring, their knowledge, and their support of each other, as well as their support for you. So now we're going to turn to probably most exciting part of the program. The part that I assume all of you have been waiting for, where we recognize each student for her hard work and accomplishments this year. Unfortunately, four of our students weren't able to be here tonight, and so we're missing and we're thinking about Sarah, Heather, and Nina, and Allison. And I'm pleased to invite our assistant, program director, Muna. She gets on my case all the time because I forget to call her assistant program director and I always say she's the person who just gets it all done. So I was admonished, you make sure that you tell everybody who I am. <laughs> and so we're gonna have, <laughs> so we're gonna have assistant program director, Muna and our internship coordinator, Denise, to assist in presenting the certificates. And the dean has graciously, I mean, we, we're privileged here. We got the <laughs> dean coming up to help. You know, normally, I can tell you, Dean Cash, he's got so many meetings to go to, sometimes he's in and out. But because you all are so special, he decided that he's gonna stay. And so I'd like to ask our faculty to gather stage right, also to congratulate our students. So come on up. I would like to ask each graduate to please come to the podium as your names are called. Daniela Bravo Turquia, please come up. <laughs> yeah. 
Yos Mary Frias. Hartel Johnson. Kara Kurtzman. Madison Liqueur. Come up, Maddie. <laughs> Stephanie Martins. Come on up. Catherine Milton, come on up. Therese Mukuru Sagara. Beatrice Basin Kulibali. <laughs> Esther Rogers. <laughs> And last but not least, Vivian Turkelgat. So congratulations to the GLPP class of 2019. Well done. And now I'd like to invite our student speakers up to after I tell you a little bit. There we go. Yeah. So this is the point in the program where I say a few words, and I don't want to make it too long because I have three pages, but I'm going to try to cut it down. So, yeah. So, um, 
I wanted to say, though, yesterday we had the McCormick appreciation lunch for all the staff, and they asked us all to say, introduce ourselves and say one thing we were really grateful for. And I, I said, you guys, you know, this class, because you've been such a wonderful cohort. So I just wanted to say that you are what I'm grateful for this year. <laughs> yeah. um, I want to say, in my work, um, I'm always struck by how many women I meet who come to our program like yourselves, who, are, who have already done or are doing such amazing things. And you tell me these things in the most casual, humble ways. And I often feel that part of my job, and it's, to me it's a really important part of my job, and part of all of our jobs is to tell you how amazing you are. Because maybe nobody has done that already, or maybe not enough people have told, have told you how amazing you are. So I'm not telling you this so you become conceited or arrogant but, or complacent. This is just to let you know that you are indeed ready to take that next step whatever that is. You do have what it takes to do that thing you've always dreamt of doing, whatever is calling your name, to fulfill your dharma or vocation. And sometimes we just need to give each other permission to dream too. And I hope this program has helped you figure that out and given you some new tools to get there and to lead the changes that we need in our society. Some of what I've written has already been covered by other speakers, so I'll just skip over that, so about social and economic injustice and so forth. So, uh, so that's been well covered by the program. Um, I will share, because I'm really into human rights, I don't know if you know that, but um, I will share with you a little uh, game that people play in, this, in the classroom to teach children about human rights. And this is the game. A new land, so this is what you tell the children, a new land has been discovered where, uh, that, that, sorry, a new land has been discovered that is needed to sustain human life. No one has ever lived there before. There are no laws and no history, and all of you will be going there. A small group has been appointed to draw up a list of rights for this new country, but no one knows in advance who they will be in the new country. You don't know what groups you will be part of or what your identity will be or what position you'll have, whether you will be rich or poor or what color or religion or ethnicity or sexual orientation or gender identity. You will be in this new country. So you will want to make sure that things are as fair as possible. So, and of course, this is what actually happens in life. All of us are born, and we have no say in what type of family or group or circumstances we'll be born into. So along the same lines, I think that all the world's great religions have some form of the golden rule that mandates that we do unto others as we would, as we would have others do unto us. So I hope that will be your guide going forward. <laughs> And finally, I leave you with a quote that I say, have been saying every year, but I really believe it, that it's a wonderful takeaway for you. And these are the words of Marian Williamson. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is not our light. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. So, thank you for being the wonderful women you are. You are the gender leadership in public policy class of 2019. And one favor I have to ask of you, please keep in touch. Please write and send, send us your news. We are always, always happy to hear from you. And we'll be calling on you as um, our new alumni <laughs> to play different roles in the program. So watch out for a call from me. So. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. Um, and I'd like to now introduce our class speakers, and I'd like to thank them all for volunteering to speak tonight. We're very excited to hear you. <laughs> so, um, our first speaker, first of all, I'd like to also recognize our um, class representatives, Danielle uh, Brava Turkia and um, Hartel Johnson, who served the cohort very well this year. We have a little gift for you.
they had to come to lots of extra meetings, and so I think they did a great job, don't you think so? Yeah, <laughs> I'll give them a round of applause. Okay. So our first um, class speaker will be Esther Rogers, who will be reading a poem by Allie Henney. Thank you. Hi, class. So, um, some of you, so bear with me. Some of you guys already heard this poem before, and um, I, Ali Henney is um, an anti-racism activist, and um, she had posted this um, poem. And when I came across it, it was really profound for me personally, and I just felt compelled to go ahead and read it to the class. Okay, so. I just want you to take a moment and just imagine that you are hiking along a trail when suddenly, suddenly you tumble down an embankment and land next to the trail below you. Unfortunately, the force of your fall managed to trigger a small avalanche. A larger boulder falls on, on your leg. You black out from the pain. When you come to, you are in the worst pain of your life and so you begin to scream for help. In the distance, you see two hikers, and so you scream at them to help you. As they get closer, they look at the boulder, then look at you. You're screaming, writhing in agony, you just might black out again. One of the hikers says to you, it's rude to scream at people. I will help you get the boulder off your lower leg, but I can't help someone who will carry on in such a manner. The two hikers walk away in disgust, each stacking more rocks on top of that boulder. You black out again. When you come to, you see a small group of hikers coming towards you, each carrying a small size walking in their hand. You yell to get their attention, and they walk over, you, over to you. You plead for help. The leader of the group says, our rocks are heavy too and you don't hear us complain about it. Angry, you scream at them, I need your help. Get, the, get this thing off of me. Instead of screaming, you should just pick up the boulder and move on, says one hiker in the group. That's what we did. Instead of screaming, you should just pick up the boulder and get it off yourself. Stop being entitled. It's not our fault that the boulder's on your leg, one of the members says. If you, were, if you were a better hiker, this wouldn't have happened. They leave, but not before a few of them kick you in the head. One of them steals your backpack. Several of them leave the rocks on top of the boulder. As more hikers pass, you get to the point where you can no longer feel your leg, but the rest of your body hurts. You yell at the hikers that come by. When that doesn't work, you cry. When that doesn't work, you try not to show any emotion at all when they're asking for help. Nothing works. You yell at the hikers, you are self-centered, but there's no one there to hear you. People come, continue to get angry at you for yelling at them. They ignore your tears. When you show no emotion, they walk away, convinced that you like being under those rocks. There are some who pretend not to see you at all, and they add more rocks to the pile. When you, when you call attention to the fact that no one has helped you, guess what? They get angry at you and throw more rocks at you. You try to move the boulder to dig yourself out, nothing works. The boulder won't budge. When it seems that you are making progress while digging, someone comes and fills the gap with more dirt. You, you, you entertain the idea of amputating your, your leg, but then you realize someone stole your pocket knife that was in the backpack. As the sun sets, you look at the boulder, the rocks on top of it, and the structure holding it all in place. You realize that the rocks that everyone has piled on you likely weigh more than the boulder itself. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Esther. It was really powerful. And now I'd like to invite up Vivian Turkelgat to be our second class speaker. Good evening to everybody. Um, I want to thank everybody that came, the professors, the dean, all the distinguished guests, my, our families, our friends. We really appreciate that you're here. Um, so I will reflect about my personal journey. Um, so I landed here in August last year from Israel with my lovely family. And that was August, middle of August. The beginning of September, I was here um, in the first uh, annual dinner that we had. On our first uh, welcome back dinner, the professor said this is going to be a transformative experience. I can s and undoubtedly say that it has. For me, this journey, journey has been very personal and very uh, professional. So I have two paths that I took this year. Um, although I already have one pair of glasses, the past year, I have learned to look through new lenses. I look now at society through race, ethnicity, gender, and I have an intersectionality lens that I use now. There is not one single story to be told, but many diverse and complex narratives. When you go on a journey, it is always helpful to ha take with you inspiring companions. In this program, I was fortunate to find many inspiring companions to share my journey. The professors, each one was passionate about their field of expertise. They shepherded us and helped us search for our own distinctive path. They encouraged us to explore and dig, dig deep into our policies and ideas they were, that we were passionate about. How could we look at the policies through a different lens? How could we look at the policy through a gender lens? Who would benefit from the, from the policy? And what policy would we write to make it better? They helped us discover our leadership skills and follow our dreams. Yes, they made us work hard, but <laughs> they were very supportive about it and empowered us to find our own unique voices. With the help and the encouragement of uh, Professor Elena Stone, um, who teaches the internship class, and you heard from her, I was for fortunate to intern at Strategies for, Ch for Children, it, which is a nonprofit that advocates for high quality, affordable early education, which my court heard all about. And, um, and Amy is here, Amy O'Leary, which I will speak to her about her now, is here, and I really um, and I am honored that you're here. Um, Amy O'Leary is the director of Strategies for Children and has um, been advocating for early education for the past 20 years. She showed me that a woman can be both a strong leader but also empower others, just like she's to here today. Um, she taught me that you could advocate for what is important for you and do so in all levels of, of communities, in the local community and in the state house. As a mother of two children, two daughters, it is important for me to show to my daughters that it is possible to create change and advocate for what you believe in. My advice to the incoming class, find a mentor who can help you in your search. Find that companion. As you heard, we were a wonderful cohort. And the, <laughs> the cohort <laughs> was a very supportive one and they were supportive companions for, the, for this journey. As a cohort with such diverse backgrounds, we learned to embrace each other's differences. We learned to listen to each other's narratives, understand how those narratives shaped who we are to get today. We learned about each other's ideas and passions from, from helping the homeless to women, women, women's issues to immigrant issues and even supporting to supporting small businesses in Africa. We were there for each other in the personal level and in the academic level. Yes, we supported each other when we were supposed to turn in our papers, mostly on time. <laughs> I now embark into a new journey, 
as I move into a leadership position as part of a Head Start program, which is my passion, and in the Community Teamwork, which is a nonprofit who facilitates social and econ econom economic change. For me, I went full circle. I want to thank each of, each of you, m the professors that have been here, the, uh, my friends the co in the cohort, Amy and Titus from Strategies for Children, and of course my family, who have been both inspiring and supportive companions and who have helped me through my extra extraordinary journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vivian. It was really nice to hear about your two journeys and a new pair of glasses, too. <laughs> it was great. So, um, I also forgot, I want to thank um, some volunteers who came tonight to help out. Uh, uh, Palma, could you stand? Palma is one of our alumni, and her daughter Palma also came. So, thank you so much for coming yeah, tonight and being here with us. And um, Jose Nino, Jose is a, a volunteer who came. Boss, Jose walk, works for the Boston Foundation, and he's also a UMass Boston graduate as well uh, of the International Relations Program. Um, and I wanted to thank Fatima and Tamerly, and, and of course, Denise Murrow, who has been fabulous in helping us uh, make this whole program go. <laughs> so anyway, Tamerly and Fatima had to go a little early because um, they were breaking the fast because it's Ramadan, so it's if, if, iftar, so they went to go, so anyway. Um, okay, so now I'm going to invite Hartel Johnson to come up to the stage. Hartel is one of the class representatives. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> oh my goodness. This is really awesome, I'm so excited. Congratulations to my cohorts. Um, my name is Hartel Johnson, Princess Warrior. This is an honor to be speaking to you, representing my graduate class of 2019. I would like to thank all the professors, faculty, staff, family, and friends, and their support. We could not have made this journey without you. I feel grateful and blessed to be a part of the UMass Boston McCormick Graduate School of Gender Leadership and Public Policy cohorts. Um, you guys have been so amazing. For me, coming to this program, I came in with the, the idea of really wanting to know more about policy because I started off with the League of Women Voters. I have to bring that to, 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 the, to this point because that's the reason why I'm here. I didn't think policy, public, uh, politics was something that I would really want to get involved or be a part of. It was just not something that we just didn't discuss in my family. So this journey has not been easy for me. I, I have considered going back to school in 2004 and it's taken me 15 years to get to this point and do it. And I'm truly grateful. I, have, I am very thankful for the adversity, discrimination, injustice, abuse, and inequality that I have faced. If I didn't have to, if I didn't experience these things, it wouldn't have shaped me and mold me into the person that I am today, and I am truly grateful. 2017 was the year that is gonna go down in history. During 2017, I decided to put my feet in the political arena. Boy, oh boy, was that a new set of racism that I had to learn, uh, new whole political jargons that I had no clue, any idea of, such like, why are you running for office, one said. We need fresh blood, another. You're not a, you're not, you're too good. You're too good to be a politician. You're better than a city council. And another, they won't vote black, a black person here. Growing up as a child into young adult, I had three rules. Don't talk about religion, don't talk about politics or sex. However, 
all three collided in 2017 for me. Within the same year, I attended Merrimack Valley Church Women Conference. I had to share, I was one of the speakers that I had to share about my personal life growing up, stepping in the spirit, really having a relationship with God. As a child, I was sexually abused. Going to church was my safe haven. I had was to learn to escape, and being in the church was a place where I could escape and cling to the hand of Christ. God only knows what I've been through. The Me Too movement was an answered prior. See, nobody knew that 2018 I would meet Tarana Burks. While I was running in 2017 and giving that speech about my abuse and helping other women walk through that abuse, I was afraid of the whole political arena, how that was gonna play out. Will that be used against me? See, I was new to the whole political um, race and everything and not knowing how that was gonna play out. And I was grateful when I heard the Me Too movement. It was an answered prior because I thought, I am not the only one. I felt that I could, I could, I felt that I could stand strong as a woman most importantly, stand strong as a black woman in the adversity and not fear and not know, and to think that I'm not alone and believe that I can go through this not alone. I had the wonderful experience and I'm so grateful for the New England Women's Policy Conference. That's where I met Tarana Burks, where she shared her experience. I can laugh in the face of adversity I can sit at the table with discrimination. I can eat a meal with inequality and ride with injustice. I believe each and every one of my classmates was specially handpicked for the 2018 cohort. I thank sweet baby Jesus when I received my acceptance letter. Receiving that letter pushed me to believe in myself and commit to pursuing my education further at UMass Boston. My classmates are beautiful, young, and old women <laughs> with international and diverse culture. As we, we as a group re represented a visual the world will live in and we represent through our values, our principle, our ethics, our ambition, the dreams, the world we envision. See, this group, we are resilience. We are the change the world wants to see. We are leaders. Each and every one of you are leaders. I stand here tonight to let you know we, the class of 2019, are a force to be reckoned with. We persevere in good and bad times. We persevere in illness. We persevere in passing of loved ones. We persevere in reading assignments and research policy, research and policy. We persevere in uncomfortable to get comfortable. We persevere in love of each other differences. I learn that we're all connected each and every one of us. Having loving human connection gives us hope to do this together. I want to thank Ann Bookman and Muna Killenbach because when I started in 2017, I was running for office and at the time I said, I can't do this, this is too much, I, I'm not ready for the program, but they believed in me and I came back 2018, here I am, and boy, I am so glad to be back and to be with this class. I, am, I feel blessed, I really do. Um, class, I want to also thank Emily, Laurie, Elaine, and Tracy for allowing us the space to share and be vulnerable. I so appreciate each and every one of you. I have a wider lens and being a photographer, you get to frame, and at least for me, I know I like to frame and put the picture just exactly how I want it so I don't have to alter it. But looking at from this 
lens that's even wider, and there's so much more that I know I, I need to do, and I want to charge my class 2019. Yes, you guys, right in front of me. I know we're missing a few, but they will get this as well. Remember, we are resilience. Yes, you are the change the world wants to see. I'm going to quote Maya Angelou. You may encounter defeat, but you must not be defeated. Please remember that your difficulties do not define you. They simply strengthen your ability to overcome. Go spread your wings and make this world a better place for everybody. Believe in yourself and do not let anyone tell you that you're not, that, that you cannot make a difference in this world. A small gesture can represent a huge difference in somebody's lives. So let's do it one small gesture at a time. Never give up, aim high, and lead with love. Thank you. God bless. Thank you so much, Hartel. And we also feel blessed that you came to the program, by the way. We feel blessed that all of you came to the program this year. You've been such a wonderful group to work with. So we can't say enough nice things about you. So <laughs> um, now I'd like to invite Danielle uh, Brava Turkia to come up to you. So good evening, everyone. I first wanted to thank our professors, staff, the dean, family, and friends, and most importantly, my cohort. It's such an honor for me to be sharing a few words with all of you tonight. And I promise I will be brief, even though some of you know that one of my biggest struggles was staying under time for class presentations, but I promise that won't be the case. Uh, I wanted to start by recognizing this accomplishment. We often don't take time to acknowledge our successes. But I wanted to mention that because tonight is truly a special celebration. I wanted to recognize this as a personal accomplishment for me because as a Latina who is a proud DACA recipient and hashtag undocumented and unafraid, I never thought I would ever get to this point. I never thought I would get to this point and achieve so much. All of these successes would not have been possible without the support of the staff of the GLPP program for granting me access to scholarships that truly made us, this success a reality for me and many of our, of our class members. This year, Hartel and I had the privilege and honor of being class representatives. I wanted to be a class rep because I wanted to accomplish th two things. Integrate meal sharing during an internship class. And Kara, your lemon drops, I will not forget anytime soon. They were amazing. <laughs> but I also, I wanted to be a class rep after I noticed that some of my classmates were struggling during a research methods class. I took that opportunity to be available to any of my classmates that were struggling because I wanted all of us to finish strong and it brings me great joy to see all of us here today. Because of that reason, I wanna take some time and highlight the true stars of this program, that being my amazing classmates that I would like to define as powerful, independent, and strong women. A cohort is composed of incredible women with different, different, different ethnic backgrounds, identities, and challenges that despite all of them, we're all here today. So I would like to start by giving some shout outs to my class by recognizing the mothers like Vivian, Katie, Karen, and Therese. And, and Esther. Yeah. <laughs> 
I apologize. Next, I wanted to distinguish my classmates who have run or have plans for running for office, like Stephanie and Hartel. And, and actually, Esther, I wanted to throw you in there because I know that you will make the changes that we want to see in our cities. <laughs> Next, I also wanted to acknowledge Maddie because she's the only undergraduate who's on a fast track program to get her master's. She's, yeah. she's not only graduating today, but will also be part of the undergraduate ceremony on May 31st. I, yes. I also wanted to recognize my classmates that will we continue their education and pursue their masters in public administration. And Nina, Allison, Maddie, Esther. I'm wishing you the best for your future plans. I also, even though she's not here, I wanted to highlight Heather because I truly enjoy learning about her passion for the nonprofit world. Lastly, I wanted to acknowledge those who are immigrants or have an immigrant background, like Sarah, Josemary, Vivian, Therese, Stephanie, and Nina, Beatrice, and myself. We come from countries like Chile, Morocco, Dominican Republic, Israel, Rwanda, Brazil, Ivory Coast. We're truly a very diverse group. Lastly, I wanted to share some insights and learning from this year. This code by Audrey Lord specifically highlights a key component of our learnings and growth this year. The code says, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not lead single issue lives. I love this code because it speaks about intersectionality, which is a concept we learned and became very familiar with this year. We learned how to apply it both at the personal and the societal level. So if we want to create the change that will impact the people in the bottom, we have to see this issue from an intersectionality lens and be critical and question everything, especially when it comes to policies that affect marginalized people. With all these insights from my cohort and our personal and, and our learnings, I am confident to say that wherever we end up, we will be amazing leaders when it comes to our passions and future careers and I admire all of you tremendously. So with that being said, cheers to the class of 2019 and congratulations all. Thank you. Well, on behalf of myself, program staff, and the, and the professors, I congratulate each of you. You all are, I keep saying it, awesome, awesome, awesome. I wish you the absolute best. Again, I thank everyone who was here to celebrate. I would like every, we have cake and we have punch, so please feel free to network and learn more about each of these wonderful graduates and just enjoy. <laughs>